For more than one occasion. Multiple occasions. Now, the gun that Mr. McQueen showed you, can you describe that gun for us, please? Well, like I said, it is a 45 dark frame, big, long barrel. May the record reflect approximately 12 inches in length? Well, would you hold... About that long. About 12 inches. Hold it up again, Mr. McQueen. If somebody wants to measure, there is a yardstick. It doesn't look like 12 to me. Would you hold your hand up again approximately the size? We are discussing the barrel now? No, just... The overall length? It is not a revolver. All right, hold your hand up again. About like that. Would you like to check, Mr. Gill? Are you going from inside or outside? I'm going from finger to finger. I'm getting 10 inches. That is pretty good. I could tell it looked about 12. That looks about 10 and a half to me if you go on the inside. And it looks like 11 if you go on the outside. Well, 10 and a half inches. Not a handgun. No question at this point. Now, you indicated that it was not a revolver. Right. And do you know the difference between a revolver and a semi-automatic? Well, I think of a revolver as a police-type gun with a little short barrel and a handle that curves down and the rotating chamber, I guess you call them. So you didn't see a rotating chamber? No. Did he give you any other details in terms of how he planned to kill her? Well, yeah. Then one time he changed his mind and he didn't really want her to suffer, so he was going to handcuff her and drown her in the bathtub. Now, on how many occasions do you recall talking to Mr. McQueen about killing his wife? Well, I talked to him about it all the time because I tried to convince him that this isn't the thing you do. Were you able to convince him that that was not the thing to do? Objection. Calls for speculation. Counsel, I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. Did Mr. McQueen make any statements to you to indicate whether or not he had been convinced not to kill his wife? Yes. Objection. Calls for opinion and speculation. Okay. okay. We're starting off with a question by plaintiff's attorney. Plaintiff's attorney is Mr. Meltzer, M-E-L-T-Z-E-R. Defense attorney is Mr. Berglund. B E R G L U N D. Okay? Here we go. When was the last time that you looked in that cabinet prior to the death of Mr. Pierce? I didn't look there hardly at all, just about never. I maybe looked there once, twice, the whole time I lived there. When was the last time that you actually looked in the cabinet? I'm not sure maybe a week prior to his death. What did you see when you looked a week prior to his death? Just hardly any food. Anything else though other than food? Not really. Pans, aluminum foil, saran wrap. Pans were kept above the sink and around the sink. So what other items did you see when you looked there a week prior to his death? Nothing but food. The cabinet area touching the kitchen next to the bathroom. What was kept in that cabinet? Now that must be the cabinet. I didn't write that there. Someone else did. The cabinet is in the wrong place. It should be against that wall and it takes up the whole wall. It's up high above the sink and he kept dishes in it. Plates, pans, pots. And did you look into that cabinet without opening it? Did it have glass fronts or open curtains? I don't think so. I think it was some of that white steel. I think you had to open them to look in if I remember. When, prior to Riley's death, did you look in that? Quite a while ago, at least three weeks or so, I never got dishes out of there at all. But what did you see when you looked? Just dishes, pots, and pans. Were there any other storage areas underneath? One drawer, and that was just pots and pans and stuff. Were there any drawers in the bar? There was a big shelf in the back, and that just had some stuff in it. Speakers, gloves, the 22 shells, and a cup. Anything just miscellaneous stuff. And did you keep any items in that? No, I didn't have anything. And did you know if Mr. Pierce kept firecrackers in the house? Yes, when did he show them to you? I'm not positive, I'm really not positive, about a month prior to Riley's death. When he showed you those firecrackers a month prior to Riley's death, what did he show you? He just showed about 15 packs of them. Were they kept in a plastic bag? I think they were in a paper bag at the time. Where was the paper bag? Where did it come from? Did you see him get them from somewhere? No. 
Where were you when they showed them to you? I was in the house. Who was present? Just me and Riley. What caused him to bring them out? I think we were going to just blast a few off outside, if I remember correctly. Have you ever been with Mr. Pierce when he shot off firecrackers in the past? Yeah, occasionally, every once in a while. Have you ever seen him throw firecrackers at anyone? No. Has he ever talked about throwing firecrackers at anyone? No. Did he ever discuss with you his plan to use firecrackers to bomb Karen McMahon's house? No. Did Jennifer Holsey ever talk to you about that? No. Did Stacy Parrish ever discuss that with you? No. Have you ever seen Mr. Pierce threaten anyone with firecrackers? No. We'll pause at this point, Mr. Meltzer, and resume at 3.30. The record will reflect that Mr. Whitley is present with counsel and we will continue cross-examination. On how many occasions have you seen Mr. Pierce with firecrackers, bottle rockets, cherry bombs, of the whole category? A few times throughout the time I have known him. Did you know Chris Hippen's style to own a handgun? Not to my knowledge. Have you ever seen him in possession of a 44 caliber magnum? No, I have no further questions. Mr. Neeson, just a few questions. Referring to People 6, the diagram, the photographs which Mr. Meltzer, the defense attorney here, showed you of the interior of the house, did they include some photographs of the left-hand side of the residence? Yes. This is the area where those cards and items on the floor were? Yes. Is that a totally separate area from the area which you have circled in green with the arrow? Yes. As far as the pictures go, the picture they took is separate from the other side. I haven't even seen a picture of a shot from the other side yet. And is this area, which is over on the left-hand side of the house, which is depicted in those photographs, those photographs were taken after the bar has been removed, is that correct? Right. You can't see the floor here. Well, that was my next question. When the bar was present, would you have been able to see this vicinity? Not too well, no. What was kept back in this back upper left-hand corner of the house? Underneath the loft, yes, nothing in the upper left-hand corner. There was a curtain over the window and there was a shelf underneath the loft on the wall and it had a one burner electric stove on it and a little hot dog cooker and a little broiler oven. Are those items shown in any of the photographs? No. The kitchen floor area is an area which is not depicted in any of these photographs. Is that the area where you looked for the firecracker residue? Yes. You testified earlier you did not find anything like that? No. In that area where you looked on the floor, did you observe any shell casings or any 22s or anything like that? No. Did you observe anything on the floor there when you checked it in terms of general litter? The garbage bags were in between the cabinet and the kitchen sink and that's about it. Was the garbage bag overflowing onto the floor? Basically it was pretty full. Did you or did anyone in your presence from Wednesday to the time that you moved the place out, did you do any vacuuming or cleaning of the kitchen floor area where the green circle is? Not to my knowledge, no. You did not? No, I did not. What about any other cleaning inside the house? No, not to my knowledge. I didn't clean anything when I came in those two days at all. I just came in and went to sleep. The photographs which were taken, which have been shown to you, the inside of the house, do you know when those pictures were taken? No, I do not. Were those pictures taken after you had came in, moving the property out that belonged to Riley Pierce? Yes, definitely. When you moved out those items, what impact did that moving process make on the floor and the appearance of cleanliness on the house? Quite a bit. It made the house a total mess. It was pretty clean when we went to move it out. At some point in time, did you see the pants belonging to Riley Pierce? Yeah. Where were the pants when you remember seeing them? Right on the corner of the bar. And they were out of the loft at that time? Yeah. Where was it that you saw those pants? That was Sunday when we moved. Do you have any recollection of where those pants may have been on Friday? When we found them Friday night? Correct. I don't know where they were, I could just guess. Where did Mr. Pierce customarily keep his pants, if you know, when he was sleeping? Up in the loft on the left-hand side against the wall. No, the right side against the wall. 
the cabinet which was next to the side of the loft is that a cabinet which you could easily open up while the one was laying in the loft yeah no problem on previous occasions when you saw what has been referred to as the front list did you make any observations as to the amounts of money which correspond with any of the other names no i did not excuse me just a moment while we're off the record i have nothing further i might have a one i might have already asked but were you sent a copy of your testimony sent a copy of my testimony given a copy of your testimony yeah the last time yes and were you given that in person or was it sent to you it was given to me in person when did that take place this morning did you have a chance to read it i looked through it what were you told about your former testimony that it was given to you nothing i was just told to read it no further questions anything else were you told that this is a script that you have to follow word by word objection leading and argumentative sustained nothing further you are excused paul cochian i guess would be the next logical witness mr rice is available yes he's in the district attorney's office your honor and should be back by now you have already been previously sworn in this case, and that also applies to this testimony as well. While we're waiting for him, can we approach the bench? The record will reflect that Mr. Rice is present again as Mr. Cochian's counsel and further cross-examination. Sir, Mr. Cochian, directing your attention again to January 31, 1985, a Thursday in relation to that date, when was the last time that you were at Riley Pierce's home? I don't remember. A week, at least. Two weeks, at least a week or two weeks, yeah. Do you remember Mr. Pierce going to Hawaii? Yes. Do you recall when he returned? No, I don't. Do you know when he left? No. In relation to New Year's Eve, do you remember when was the last time you were at his home? It was before New Year's Eve, I think. I don't remember. In relation to Christmas, do you remember when was the last time you were at his home? I don't remember when was the last time I was there. Is it fair to say that you have visited Mr. Pierce's home on many occasions? I have been there three or four times at the most. Were those all in 1984? Yes. Did you ever see a gun at the home of Wayner Way? Yeah. And did you ever have discussions with Mr. Pierce about a gun? No. Did Mr. Pierce ever try to buy a gun from you? No. When you were arrested, you had a 22 caliber clip in your possession, right? Yes. What did that belong to? A 22 caliber gun. Did you sell the 22 caliber gun? No, I didn't. Did you own the 22 caliber gun? Yes. Where was the 22 caliber gun at the time that you were arrested? Where it is right now. Where? At my father's house. In other words, you have the clip at home and you have the 22 at your father's house? Yes. In relation to your arrest, when was the last time that you had actually touched the gun? I don't remember. It's been a long time. Weeks, months prior to your arrest? Months. What caused you to take it to your father's house? My probation. When were you placed on probation? I don't remember the exact date. Did you have a conversation with a probation officer or an attorney which caused you to do that? Yes, my probation said I wasn't allowed to own guns, to have guns, so I gave it to my dad. This was before your most recent arrest, correct? Yes. That same probation told you you were also to obey all other laws, correct? Yes. And your most recent probation violation stemmed from the fact that you did not do that, correct? Correct. Did you have occasion to use the gun in any way between the time that you gave it to your father and the day of your arrest? No. And do you know personally if anyone else used it? No. Did you have any discussions with your father concerning that gun? Just that it's still at the house in the city. Right. What's the address of the house where the 22 is? 373 Baltimore Way. What city? San Francisco. And is there a phone there? Yes. Objection. Irrelevant. Sustained. Your Honor, McDaniels says that discovery is a legitimate objective. And I would certainly say that the location of a gun of a 22 caliber which was owned in part by someone associated with the victim in this case is relevant. Sure, why clutter the record though with such information? It's been so long I can't remember right now. I was going to have him write it down and give it to you. What's your father's full name, George Cochian? 
Did you purchase cocaine from Mr. Pierce? I had it in the past. Was he your source of supply? Yes. Did you call on either Thursday or Friday? That is the first, excuse me, January 31 or February 1st to Mr. Pierce's home? Not that I can recall, no. And did you have any conversations with Mr. Gullo during that period of time? No. Do you know someone by the name of Chris Hippenstyle? Chris who? Hippenstyle. No. Do you know a person by the name of Hippie Richard? Yes. And what do you know about Hippie Richard? Have you met him personally? Yes, a couple of times. But do you know him to be a friend of Mr. Pierce's? Yes. Do you know him to be a source of cocaine? Yes. Did you ever purchase cocaine from him? No, sir. Did you know Mr. Pierce to have purchased cocaine from him? I don't know. When was the last time that you saw Hippie Richard? Months ago. Where did you see him? The last time that I was in Felton. Whereabouts was that in Felton at a deli? How did you meet him? I don't remember. Did someone introduce you to him? Probably I don't remember. Have you seen him in the company of Mr. Pierce on any occasion? No, sir. Two twenty-five, four boys for five minutes. Question by plaintiff's attorney. <clears throat> If you would look on the last page of that register, check number 781, is that the check that you wrote to close the account? No, there's one check after that. Well, the check after it is dated, it appears to be a counter check. Well, that's not one of the list of checks. Okay, the last check written, that would be the one that I closed the account with. And so that check was made payable to cash and you received that money. Yes, I didn't remember the amount. Other than that one instance, were any of the checks made payable to cash done by you without Arlen's request? I'm sorry? All of the checks made payable to cash were those all done at Arlen's request? Yes. And the cash from those checks was given to him? Yes. The register has a column which there is stated a purpose, the reason for the purpose of the check, what the check was issued for. Do you recall how that column was prepared? Yes, I wrote that to the best of my knowledge. I done it from like the comment that was on the check and some receipts and different things like that. To the best of your knowledge, that column accurately reflects the purpose of each check that's shown on there? Yes. And some of the checks do not have a purpose that you could not recall? Well, yeah. And don't have a listed purpose. Also, I discussed with you earlier, if you look to page five on the check register, almost to the bottom, Check number 522, it was written in the sum of $450. Do you recall that check? Yes, I do. And what was that for? It was for a vintage Coca-Cola cooler. But what happened to that Coca-Cola? I took that when I moved. So that is something else uh, that should be charged to your account? Yes. You testified yesterday about some of the abusive situations in which you were involved. You stated that it started about July of 1986. Can you tell the jury why you did not leave the Cherry Valley property when that started happening? I wasn't able to. I wasn't strong enough to leave my, on my own accord at the time. You mean physically strong enough? Mentally and physically, I. At some time, obviously you did leave, is that correct? Yes, I did. And when did that happen? Well, I left when I had to go to my son's wedding, but that's, I left once before that. Let's go to the first time before that. Where did you go? I went to my sister's house in Riverside. Do you know approximately when that was? It was not too long before I left on a permanent basis. It was in the fall of 86. You went to stay with a sister in Riverside? Yes. And did you have subsequent conversation with Arlen after that? Yes, I was there a few days. I don't remember how many. I was not very good at keeping track by then. I thought I should do something about the situation. And all my money was invested out there, and so I called him to see about making some financial arrangement on paper to take care of what he owed me. I was told that he didn't want to come over to my sister's, and he didn't want to talk about it on the phone. I should come out there. And did you go out there? Yes, I did. And uh, did you discuss financial settlement when you got out there with him? He said he didn't want to talk about it, and that he wanted me to stay, and I found myself right back in the same situation. And you stayed there until you left for your son's wedding? Yes. Was your son's wedding in the local area? It was in Oregon. Was there something that happened there that helped you leave the situation permanently? 
I, I'm going to object to the question sustained. There doesn't appear to be any relevance to that question without an offer of proof. And if you wish to make an offer, you better go in chambers. Very well, I'll withdraw the question. Do you recall the date of your son's wedding? Yes, it was November 6, 1986. I'm sorry, November 6, 1986. So on or about that date you left and have not returned? Yes. Well, you have not returned to stay. Did you go out there and obtain some property? Yes, I did. And what did you obtain from the property? My belongings, most of them. Were these belongings that were acquired while you and Arlen were together? A couple of items were. Most of it came from where I lived before. In Sunnyvale? Yes. Most of it was furniture you moved down from Sunnyvale? Yes. Do you recall what items you took with you that were acquired when you were with Arlen? Well, I was with him. What was acquired? Yes. The Coca-Cola cooler, some clocks, and some jukeboxes. I'd like to at this time, Your Honor, move to admit Exhibit 12 into evidence. Are you going to want to be heard on that? Yes, Your Honor, I will. Very well. I'll still reserve ruling on it. I don't think I have any further questions at this time of Mrs. Wayne. Mr. Crafts, you may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Wayne, when you left the property, when you went back to the property, what time that you removed your items of personal belongings? And did you also take with you a satellite television system? Oh, yes. Not the whole thing, though. You left the wire dish there, right? Yes. Do you recall how much you had paid for that satellite dish? A little over $4,000. Now, that included the entire system, is that correct? Yes. The most expensive part of the system was, of course, the electronic gear, was it not? No. Was the dish the most important part? Expensive. Expensive. And the equipment that I took was probably about half the value of the system. Was there any request made on January the 29th at the time the motion for the lineup was heard by anybody or any mention made about any type of lineup procedure involving the use of bandanas or other facial coverings? No. Did you have a conversation with Detective Flynn sometime in the afternoon hours of February, the day before the lineup? No, the conversation he testified about took place a few days earlier. When was that to the best of your recollection? It was around, I would say, the previous Thursday, which was, I believe, the 31st of January. And would you please tell the court your recollection of that conversation? I had received a message that indicated the date and time of the lineup. I called him to confirm so that I could be sure of when it was going to happen. I introduced myself, told him who I was representing, asked him whether in fact February the 5th at 2 p.m. was the correct date and time of my lineup, and he confirmed it. He asked me who was representing the other two defendants, and I told him, and that was about it. To the best of your recollection, sir, was there ever any discussion between yourself and Detective Flynn involving you or your office contacting me? There was no such discussion. Was that the only conversation you had with Detective Flynn with respect to the time and date of the lineup? That is correct. And did you at any time ever make any sort of agreement with Detective Flynn whereby you were going to contact me as opposed to him? No. You did attend the lineup on February the 5th, is that correct? Yes, I did. Prior to the time you got down to the Orange County Jail on February the 5th for that lineup, had you been made aware that there would be any request or attempt on the part of the appropriate law enforcement officials to have some sort of lineup involving the use of bandanas? No, I did not become aware of that. May I interject something else, by the way? Yes. In my telephone conversation with Detective Flynn, again, he did mention to me that Hudson's lineup would be held at 2.30 that same day, okay? How about a voice identification procedure where you ever made aware of any desire on the part of the law enforcement to have such a procedure conducted prior to the time you got down there on February the 5th? No. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Mr. Hulsenbeck, any examination of this witness? Just a few questions. Mr. Margines, did you make any notes of the conversation with Detective Flynn? No. Did you make any notes in any of your calendars as to the date and times of the lineup? 
I believe I made a note of the date and time of Richardson's lineup, but not of Hudson's. How long would you say this conversation with Detective Flynn lasted? Maybe five minutes. And isn't it true that you are the one who returned his call? Based on the information that you had received a phone message, well, the message I received, it didn't say that I should call him, but I did call him. Now, you are positive that you didn't volunteer to relay some information to the public defender's office regarding the second suspect? Positive, yes. And is it true also that during this conversation, the time and place of this other lineup not involving your client was in fact mentioned by the detective? Yes. And you distinctly remember that? I remember that he mentioned to me, he confirmed rather that Richardson's lineup would be at two, and he said Hudson was set for 2.30. And you made absolutely no notes regarding this conversation at any time, contemporaneously or a few moments after it regarding what was said. I made notes regarding that conversation. And although I made them after we showed up in court on, I think it was February the 6th, and came to learn that the lineup was conducted without Mr. Bovee's presence, and there would be a problem. I did make notes, but I didn't make them at the time or the day that I talked to the detective. Now, at the lineup itself, is it true that the detective or the supervising officer there requested you to stay and sort of fill in for Mr. Bovee on the second lineup? No, he didn't request that I stay or fill in. After Richardson's lineup was over, he asked me to come up and sign the book again, that red covered log that is used for all the lineups, and I told him that I was not representing Hudson and would not sign it and would not, would not be staying for the lineup. Okay. That is because you felt that your duty had been in fact fulfilled in your representation of Mr. Richardson at the lineup that you participated in? That's right. Did you leave immediately from the jail? No. I had previously asked that Mr. Richardson be sent over to the attorney's area so that I could tell him the results of his lineup. And I did go over there and talk to him. I guess what I'm driving at here is that you left the area where the lineups were conducted and went to another area in the jail for a different purpose? Yes, that's right. Did you then have the opportunity to observe any of the lineup that was subsequently conducted regarding Mr. Hudson? No. Thank you. I have no further questions. Okay. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. You may step down, sir. Thank you. With respect to the order of the witnesses, I think we will move back to the district attorney and let him continue. Now that concludes whatever evidence I wanted to produce with this issue. With respect to this issue and Mr. Hulsenbeck, now your next witness, will that be on the, we are getting into the substantive crime. Okay. What the court is going to do is consider the issue with respect to the lack of representation at the lineup in Mr. Hudson's case and the motion to exclude any in-court identity.